Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Wednesday. Uh, the um, we have two more lectures today and tomorrow, and then we have Monday off. That's a holiday. We'll do some review for the first midterm tomorrow, and you probably all know that the midterm is Monday evening Pacific time, uh, 6.30. That's uh, on your course information, and a basically a, a new quiz will appear, and it will be called the uh, midterm one, and it'll be assigned to you guys, and you'll take it. It'll be timed, uh, so you have uh, 90 minutes to get through it. Uh, it will be composed, we'll go over it tomorrow, it'll be composed of uh, mostly stuff you've seen. So it shouldn't be too uh, too strenuous. I know how fast we go, so we try to take it a little easy on you in the summer. But um, most of the questions you'll see would have been in a fall semester as well. Uh, so we're trying to hold to the same standard. Yeah. Uh, a lab that meets at the same time. So it's going to be, uh, I'm sorry, did I say um, Monday evening? Because it is Tuesday this time. It says that on uh, the syllabus, the, and I think I just said Monday. <laughs> Great. Uh, it is Tuesday evening, but yes, there could be labs that meet at that time. Uh, okay, so uh, there is an alternate time for people in time zones uh, where 6 a.m. is midnight. Um, so uh, that alternate exam time, uh, will likely be, unfortunately, 6.30 a.m. the next day for you guys uh, who have a lab at that time. So if you do, there's the, you can email uh, Sydney. Sydney, you may be able to preemptively stop that by just looking at the people who have Tuesday uh, lab, um, Tuesday evening lab. Uh, so uh, good. Thanks for bringing that up. We have a um, uh, uh, there's one other administrative thing. It wasn't uh, it wasn't a, a big deal. Uh, I hope you all know on the syllabus there are links to online textbooks. Uh, I hope you found those. Some people were uh, uh, wanted more reference information, so that's been there the whole semester. You can click on the last column, and it'll take you to an online textbook that has uh, information that I've reviewed, and I think it's good. Um, so uh, be ready for that. Uh, Zoom rooms starting um, even tomorrow or maybe Tuesday. Uh, tomorrow is probably a good time to start that. We will stop randomly assigning you uh, and assign you the groups that you've selected. So a couple of people have selected groups that they want to stay in for the rest of the semester. So if you haven't done that yet, uh, who do they, uh, Ben, you? Uh, email Andrew with your the group you'd like to work with, and uh, you'll be uh, with that group for the rest of the semester. Um, otherwise, uh, you'll just be randomly assigned one more time, and then you'll stay with that group for the rest of the semester. Uh, okay, so we were talking about uh, the vapor pressure of water, and we defined vapor pressure, and we talked about how there was... Uh, some vapor over the liquid water at uh, essentially all temperatures. It can be very low vapor pressure. But that vapor pressure, since the way we write equilibrium expressions, Q, that vapor pressure is numerically equal to the equilibrium constant because the vapor pressure is a constant at a constant temperature. The constant K, the value of the equilibrium constant changes with temperature, and this is a good way to un understand why that is, the uh, value Q, e the equilibrium quotient, is always the vapor pressure, and it's at equilibrium as long as the temperature is constant. If you change the temperature, it'll level out at a new constant. So Q is a constant as long as the temperature is a constant. So let's ask you this, which is true under standard conditions of this reaction? What's the relative sizes of Q and K? So let's talk about that in our small groups and 
Uh, we'll take a vote. Okay, um, let's see. You can continue, uh, continue chatting uh, about this a little bit, but uh, start pushing your button if you haven't so far. Again, uh, just your gut feeling and a guess is all it takes. I will say... Uh, Standard conditions, room temperature, and standard states is what we're talking about here. Okay, most people have responded. Uh, we'll take a look. If you haven't responded, go ahead, just take a stab, push a button. Uh, so we're uh, actually uh, spread out all over the place. Um, uh, B is most popular, but uh, only by a little 40%, and there's 20 and 30% for the others. So uh, it sounds like we need to talk about that. Let's do this. Uh, here are some possible answers for A, B, and C. Let's start the, I'll start the poll again. Look at these possible answers in chat. Uh, see if you can evaluate which one sounds the best. You can respond again with your eye clicker. Okay, so after thinking about arguments for all these, let's see what you're thinking. So we have about the same number of people. Let's see what you think now. Uh, now more strongly for B. So the system is at equilibrium under standard conditions. So Q equals K is the argument you're buying there. Uh, nobody wants to buy this one. 
standard freaking conditions are one atmosphere of everything. <laughs> standard states, standard conditions. I don't know how many times I need to say this. It's not equilibrium. Standard states are not any of that stuff. It's just this random state that we say everything's at one molar if it's in concentration or one atmosphere if it's a gas. The partial pressure of water is artificially one atmosphere because we're at standard states, standard conditions. So you understand, we saw in the last slide, that <laughs> I'm harping on you. <laughs> the uh, vapor pressure uh, is uh, numerically equal to um, K at this temperature, but the vapor pressure is the temperature at uh, the pressure at 25 degrees C at room temperature, the vapor pressure. That's not the pressure we have the system at. We have artificially put the system under standard states. So the pressure of water is one atmosphere gas. So that means standard conditions, Q is one. Q is the instantaneous measurement. And it's one because we stuck it that way the pressure of water, but K, since the temperature is 25 degrees C, is 0.03. So three hundredths of an atmosphere, so Q is much bigger than K. So again, this is going to come up on the midterm uh, when I say standard conditions, when anyone, not just me, if we're talking uh, in, the, in the science community, standard states, this, it's not an equilibrium. It's not the beginning of the reaction. It's not the end of the reaction. It's everything is in a standard state. If you're a gas, you're one atmosphere. If you're a concentration solution, you're one molar. If you're a pure, lot, pure liquid or solid, you just have to be present. So uh, there are the, uh, that's a drilling that one home for you. Uh, speaking of the midterm, there will be review sessions and we'll send out an announcement. And uh, apparently there was an error in the previous announcement that said it's Tuesday, July 5th. <laughs> and apparently Tuesday is July 6th. So let's get this straight. We'll put it in the announcement that'll go out today. The exam is 6.30 p.m. Tuesday, July 6th. I hope I'm saying that right now. Uh, okay. So how does this K vary with temperature now? So let's go through that one uh, together. I think you understand how uh, K varies with temperature now because you know that there's more vapor pressure at higher temperatures. So Q gets bigger and Q is always the value of the equilibrium expression. We just call it K when it stops changing because it, it's a constant. So Q is always the instantaneous value. And when it's at equilibrium, Q and K are the same. Here, how does that K vary with temperature? Well, the pressure of the vapor pressure, the pressure of a gas over a liquid, I think we intuitively understand, understand at higher temperatures, the gas phase is more favored. So if you have this equilibrium, the gas phase is more favored. So you would expect the pressure to increase and the pressure is the value of Q and it's the value of K when you come to equilibrium at that temperature. So you should expect it to increase. There's only one that increases. Here it says K is independent of temperature. That's not true. Here K is decreasing. Here K is increasing. These are all the values of the equilibrium constant for different temperatures. So let's look at that. And it's actually right there on the phase diagram. Remember we said the phase diagram, the lines are the phase diagrams, are all the points where there's an equilibrium between the two phases. So this is the liquid gas equilibrium line. So if you measure the pressure of the gaseous water at any of those states versus temperature, you're measuring K versus temperature. Okay, cool. Uh, so let's talk about now uh, how you get to equilibrium. 
So we've got this idea that reactions go to equilibrium. And when we're talking about thermodynamics, that's the state we're talking about. We talk about two states in thermodynamics. One is the zero state, the reference state, where everything is one molar or one atmosphere, standard states. The other state is equilibrium. Uh, so uh, when you measure a standard state enthalpy, it's the difference between the standard state and the equilibrium state. So if it's going to go all the way to products and K is going to be very large, then that's the state you're talking about. Basically, time is not an issue. You have to say, all I can tell you is what happens at equilibrium. But you know, if you're sitting at all reactants, you are not at equilibrium. If you're sitting at all products, you're not at equilibrium. So you have to decide how you get there. And I think you may understand already, there's various ways to do this. When you're not at equilibrium, you're higher, uh, you're not at a minimum on your free energy landscape. And I'm calling it the free energy landscape now because we know the minimum in free energy is what we really look for in predicting where a reaction will end up. So how do we get to these minima in free energy landscapes? Well, it, it's just how the reaction proceeds. Start at reactants or start from standard states, whatever you'd like. How does it approach equilibrium? And I think you um, can probably guess there's a, a lot of ways. When we took our balloon and we had hydrogen and oxygen in it, that's actually up here. That's the thermodynamically unstable state. And why is it thermodynamically unstable? Well, that's why that word stable kind of gets in the way. It's just higher in free energy or higher in energy than other states. So if you're going to compare this to uh, the uh, after the explosion, when you make water, then if you're going to compare it to water, water is lower energy. We see that goes down enthalpy hill, and now we understand it goes down free energy hill. So water has to be one of these. And this is this whole idea about stability and why it's kind of a, a funny thing to say. This is thermodynamically unstable compared to water. We know that it's uh, kinetically stable. It, uh, hydrogen and oxygen can stay together in that balloon. But if we measure it relative to water, it's higher energy. And that's all stability and instability means. And I try not to use the words. I try to say lower in energy. So there the explosion and you go to water. Water is at the lower state. So it could approach equilibrium. Here we're going to plot concentration uh, or pressures versus time. and they can approach equilibrium in just kind of a linear approach and then level out at equilibrium. So monotonic, no change in the slope as it, uh, as it goes and reaches equilibrium. Uh, it could approach it in kind of a step function. So it sits there for a long time, suddenly changes to the equilibrium situation. That's kind of like an explosion, but a lot of... Uh, there are other reactions that approach rapidly, uh, and we can look at them. Here is a chemical reaction where this is going to happen. I like this guy. So we're going to mix two chemicals together and nothing is going to appear to happen for a few seconds. So it looks like it's sitting there, nothing is happening, but we're going to have a rapid instantaneous step from unstable thermodynamically low energy, high energy to low energy, just like that. And now it's at equilibrium, it's going to stay there. Poopy, did I do that? Oh no, I did not do do Chrome full screen. I just did uh, 
Okay. Uh, so, um, actually, same slide. This is uh, this is uh, when I did this in a formal studio. Uh, it was quite a long time ago, um, actually. So we've been giving this kind of same lecture for a long time. Um, I still have all these clothes. <laughs> I should have. <laughs> is this that shirt? No, I don't think so. Uh, I should have just worn that. That would have been funny. A uh, little bit different facial hair uh, than uh, back then. Um, uh, kind of went for the uh, Tony Stark look uh, after a while. <laughs> have, you, have you seen the first Iron Man where Tony Stark has that crazy goatee? It's really cool. You can go back and look at it. Um, and I'm thinking, okay, Tony Stark, uh, eccentric genius, uh, wisecracker, um, uh, rakishly handsome, me, me, me. <laughs> so hence the uh the facial hair actually there's probably an app is there a which marvel universe character you are app uh somebody find that uh see if we can do it uh don't do it during class <laughs> somebody after the fact take a screenshot of me <laughs> see which marvel character i am <laughs> i want to know where i am in i wouldn't be surprised if it was the hemworth uh you know <laughs> but anyway uh back to science <laughs> so another way you could reach equilibrium is a little more uh 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 interesting uh this is rare but the reaction can proceed rapidly past equilibrium and then uh the reverse reaction gets fast then the uh, forward reaction gets fast, and this goes back and forth and back and forth, and that is an oscillatory chemical reaction. And you can, uh, these are easy to do in uh, the laboratory uh, as well. So here I'm mixing two chemicals. It goes to from yellow to blue, but it passes the equilibrium state. Now it's going to come back in the other direction, back to the yellow state, and then pass that again, back to the blue state, and back and forth. And it'll do that. It'll oscillate for quite a few oscillations, and <laughs> it'll come to a uh, equilibrium, a kind of a combination between the uh, blue and yellow states so the overall profile you can see i've got it in the dotted line is an approach to equilibrium it just passes it and you could chaotically approach uh equilibrium too um where there is no uh you can't predict what this curve looks like even from reaction to reaction it's uh chaos formally means in mathematics uh it's exquisitely sensitive to your initial conditions. It's so exquisitely sensitive that uh, this is where you hear that term, a butterfly flaps its wings in you know, China and we have a hurricane in the Pacific. Uh, they're just, you've took the whole system of the earth and a tiny little perturbation made something that you didn't expect. So that's uh, how uh, some reactions approach equilibrium. So let's do this. Here's the sublimation now. Sublimation, the solid going to the gas of iodine. Iodine, uh, the elemental iodine is a solid at room temperature, but it has iodine gas vapor above it. So there's an equilibrium expression for that. What I want to ask you is what happens to the vapor color when you add more iodine solid to that? So what happens essentially to the amount of iodine gas. So you're looking above the gas for the color of the that phase. Think about that for a minute, chat in your groups, and we'll take a vote.
Okay, let's see what you guys are thinking uh, on this one. Push a button if you have not yet. So A is very popular. Uh, more solid will create more gas, so the color gets darker. Uh, so, uh, and that's, wow, over half of you uh, think that. So um, these chem quizzes, very conceptual, and that's why we ask them. And it's not surprising uh, that I don't agree with you on this one uh, either. So you want to know what happens when I add solid? Well. If you have an equilibrium expression, you can calculate Q at any time and compare it to the value of K. So if Q gets bigger, that means you have too many products over reactants. And you'd say, oh, I have to go back towards reactants. If Q gets smaller than K, then you have too many reactants and you should go towards products. And that in general is absolutely true. However, in this case, if you write the equilibrium expression, it's the products, the pressure of iodine gas, over the reactants, but the reactants are a pure solid. So they do not appear in an equilibrium expression. So the amount of pure solid does not affect the amount of the pressure of the gas. And I think you know that when you talk about water, if I have a, a glass of water and I say, what's the pressure, vapor pressure of water, it doesn't matter if you have a big bowl of water or a small bowl of water, the amount of gas over the water is the same. Same thing with the sublimation, the solid. So the vapor pressure of iodine, but it's independent of the solid. So adding more solid doesn't change that color density. Uh, one way to think of it is, well, you added more solid, more solid has more surface area. Now you have more surface area for the gas to condense back to. So that equilibrium is maintained. Great. Uh, what happens to the vapor intensity when the temperature is raised? So let's talk about this one together. So uh, the temperature is raised. And I think that you guys will get right on top of this one because we've talked about it several times now. If you write the equilibrium expression here, it's the vapor pressure. This time it's a solid uh, a sublimation vapor pressure coming from the solid, not a liquid. But it's still a vapor pressure. And you expect at higher temperatures the vapor to be more favored. So delta G, you got this feeling now. Delta G is changing with temperature. We saw that. We plotted delta G versus temperature. It does change. The products, the gas becomes more favored. And if the gas is more favored, there's more of it at equilibrium. K is going to get bigger. And intuitively, we understand that for the vapor pressure. That's why we use this example. We're harping on this example because we understand higher temperature, more vapor. So we should expect as we raise the temperature that we should get the same kind of, uh, whoop, uh, back one, the same kind of relationship uh, between uh, the solid and the gas. That's this equilibrium line. And that has the same kind of shape, increases with temperature. OK, we could look at a video of that. It's not particularly exciting. We warm it up, it gets darker. So uh, let's uh continue on so uh let's now think more about we've been disturbing the equilibria let's think more about disturbing equilibria and uh one of the people in my uh uh discussion groups said uh was familiar with this and said for the last one well you add solid that's a reactant it should shift towards products and in general that is the case because you could calculate those Qs and Ks. You add, uh, you add reactants, and that's in the denominator. Q gets small. You got to make products to get Q back to an equilibrium value. So in general, that's the case. It was a special case that we had where iodine solid didn't appear in the equilibrium expression. It does not affect the actual amount. And that's in general true. The actual amount of the pure liquids and solids 
doesn't affect the position of the equilibrium. So here's a gas. Here's our, our favorite dimerization. Uh, so we have uh, NO2 uh, uh, nitrogen oxide going to the dinitrogen uh, oxide compound. So monomers going to dimers. And this is just schematic. So I'm not writing the uh, molecules. I'm just saying each ball is an NO2. And each uh, ball here, dimers. That's just to keep track of the fact that there's twice as many particles on this side as there are in this side stoichiometrically. OK, we don't know that that number stays two, and it's very unlikely it stays two at equilibrium. You could start it that way, but this is just schematically showing the stoichiometry. And these are gases. And we've been talking about gases uh, quite a bit. And we have some intuitive ideas of gases. We're, we'll study the ideal gas law. I'm sure many of you can say PV equals NRT uh, in your sleep. That's an equation of state. <laughs> when the equation of state goes by in its motorcade, uh, the flags have PV equals NRT on them. <laughs> uh, I cracked myself up. Anyway, the uh, gases, the pressure of the gas behaves in kind of intuitive ways. We know the pressure comes from the particles banging into the sides of the container. So more particles, more pressure. If you increase the volume, then there's not there's more surface area of the flask to knock into, same number of particles, so not as many collisions. Pressure goes down. If you squeeze it, and that's kind of intuitive. You squeeze it, the pressure goes up. Less surface area, same number of particles hitting it, more pressure. And I think you might intuitively understand the temperature because we've talked about the temperature goes into the, is a measure, a literal measure of the randomness, the kinetic energy in the system. For a gas, it's exactly the kinetic energy of the system. Gases only have kinetic energy. So you raise the temperature, more kinetic energy, the particles, they're hitting the walls with higher kinetic energy, the pressure goes up. So pressure proportional to the number of particles and the temperature inversely proportional to the volume. So at 25 degrees C, K is around seven and it's exothermic, this chemical reaction as written. Q is written as the equilibrium expression, products over reactants. They're both gases. So it's the pressure of N2O4 uh, over the brown. So the clear gas over the uh, NO2, the brown gas. And that is squared because there's a stoichiometric coefficient of two here. That's how we write our equilibrium expressions. This brown gas is one of the small gases that you see um, that. Uh, over the over very polluted cities, this uh, chemical reaction happens uh, in um, the upper atmosphere. Uh, ultraviolet light uh, and nitrogen and oxygen can react to form this. It's accelerated by uh, nitrogen compounds coming from uh, fertilizers and pollution, uh, other uh, burning of uh, uh, natural products. So. Uh, brown is uh, the reactant molecule. Clear is the product molecule. And it'll come to some equilibrium, and that'll be a function of the temperature. So it'll stay a constant, this value, when it comes to equilibrium, unless you change the temperature. You can change the concentrations, partial pressures all you want. Q will change momentarily, but it'll come back to equilibrium. It'll be the same value that you had a minute ago unless you change the temperature. So here I have all the brown gas in one side of a flask. I'm going to open this valve and let the gas expand into two flasks. As the system approaches equilibrium, what happens to the color intensity? Darker, lighter, or stays the same? There's my little expansion. 
opening the gas. Let's think about this for a second and take a vote. Okay, let's come back uh, together. It looks like many of you have voted. Push a button if you have not so far. That's most of you. Uh, many of you are thinking C. Uh, in fact, overwhelmingly C, it decreases. And I agree, it absolutely decreases when you open the valve because you, sp you sp spread out the, the gas. So it's less dark. Uh, the concentration of the gas goes down. The pressure of the gas drops by a factor of two. Volume went up by a factor of two. Pressure went down by a factor of two. It's directly proportional is what we call that. So that's probably a lot of what the C people are thinking. The question is, after it did that, you have to check that it's still at equilibrium. If it's still at equilibrium, then... There won't be any change from that, and it'll stay lighter. If that's not equilibrium, which way will it shift? And that's kind of the expression here. So the volume is doubled, but 
from there, as you approach equilibrium, what will the color intensity be? So let's talk about that. So here are the possible explanation. Denominator of Q is squared, doubling the volume makes Q uh, greater than K and the reaction will shift towards reactants or be darker. Uh, an explanation for B, the equilibrium is independent of the volume, so the color doesn't change, or the color, color will continue to get lighter because the gas expands to fill the new volume. Uh, that's a lot of what uh, many of you were saying, but will it continue to get lighter from there? There's no more expansion. Let's do the calculation. This one you could actually calculate. So the pressures are the ratio of the pressures is the expression we're talking about. It is a constant value, that ratio, unless you disturb it, but it will come back to that constant after you disturb it. The perturbation, the disturbance we introduced was doubling the volume, which halves the pressures. So we could just calculate a new value for that expression. It's probably not gonna be that same constant anymore. It's half the pressure and half the pressure. So that one half in the denominator will have to be squared. So you'll have uh, one over four there. That would come up into the numerator and multiply that one over two. And you'll have Q temporarily twice the value that it was when you started. So you have a K, uh, excuse me, you have a Q much greater than the original than k it's twice what k should be so if it's twice what k should be then where does the reaction shift well k is too big or q is too big how do you make the expression smaller well you have to make the numerator bigger that'll make it smaller making the numerator bigger is a shift towards reactants and the reactants are the dark gas no2 so you expect as it approaches equilibrium, it'll get to a new equilibrium state. It'll go from that lighter state because you expanded it to a slightly darker state uh, because the equilibrium will shift under those conditions. So this is a general principle known as Le Chatelier's principle. You disturb an equilibrium, but it's a dynamic equilibrium. It can shift. And for some crazy reason of the universe that we understand that I, I kind of in I kind of insinuated is due to the second law of thermodynamics, the increasing entropy of the universe, how each individual product or reactant, each individual molecule reacts to a change, increases the entropy of the universe and you can track the individual entropies that the ratio is this thing called uh, Q and it does, because of the, the magic of the universe, that ratio always comes to the same number. It's kind of wacky, but true. So here's an, here's a equilibrium, a, a system at equilibrium. What we did was change the volume. We doubled it. And you all said correctly, well, when you double it, it the, the gas is less dense. The whole thing is going to look lighter. And I agree, less dense gas, more volume, same number of particles, less density, lighter color. And, but we just calculated that that's a change in that, those partial pressures, the pressures of the gases. If it's a change in the pressures, then the value of that ratio changes. You have to compare it to what it needs to be or what it will come to. And that's what we did. We found that Q, attained a value that was twice the value of the equilibrium constant. So it'll shift, there'll be a pressure change and a change in Q to get back to K. And that change is to shift to the side of the reaction that has more particles. We calculated it and said, well, Q is greater than, uh, Q is greater than K, so I'll shift towards reactants. Another way to think of it is the system wants to fill up that volume. So there's a tendency 
and this is a natural tendency in the universe as well, is matter expands to fill the volume that you give it. The best way to expand and fill the volume is in this case, make more particles. The way to make more particles is go back towards reactants. The reactants were the monomers, the products were the dimers. So you get darker as you approach equilibrium. Okay, let's try to reverse uh, blood poisoning using Le Chatelier's principle. Which strategy? So carbon monoxide binds very strongly to hemoglobin. And it bonds so strongly, it, it dis uh, hemoglobin bonds to carbon dioxide, oxygen, and unfortunately, carbon monoxide. And the bond to bonding to carbon monoxide is stronger than the oxygen and the carbon dioxide. So the carbon monoxide can displace oxygen from hemoglobin. And you can still breathe in and out. However, the oxygen you're breathing in and out can't bind to the hemoglobin and be passed into your blood. So you asphyxiate uh, anyway. Um, so with that in mind, what would you say the size, relative size of K is for this expression? So let me just ask you that in a, in a, in a uh, rapid chem quiz. The question is just quickly, oops. The question is just quickly, is K, K is not equal to one. Is it bigger than one or smaller than one? A, you think it's bigger than one. B, you think it's smaller than one. Just Give me your impressions. Uh, we're equal about. Uh, I'm showing you the distribution. Uh, you notice normally I don't show it to you in real time. And I don't do that because uh, that influences <laughs> that influences uh, what people think. Say, oh, everybody's thinking A. I better vote A. Um, in this case, uh, that is happening. OK, so well over half of us uh, think uh, that K is bigger than 1. That was the. Um, idea. And yes, of course, K is bigger than one. That's why it's poisonous. K is bigger than one at equilibrium. The product side is favored. Okay. That's why it's dangerous. If the reactant side was favored, uh, yeah, oxygen wins. It always gets to uh, bind. So what would you do if you were in this situation? Well, let's just talk through this one. Uh, could you cool uh, the patient off, put him in an ice bath? Could you increase the partial pressure, increase the pressure of oxygen? So give them an oxygen mask. Uh, and uh, so they're breathing more like pure oxygen rather than oxygen at atmospheric concentrations. Oxygen at atmospheric concentration is only 20% of the atmosphere. If you make it 100% of the atmosphere, one atmosphere of oxygen gas, that increases that partial pressure. Uh, or remove hemoglobin. Uh, use the old-fashioned uh, way, the medicine of the Middle Ages. Uh, put some leeches <laughs> on their arms. <laughs> and see, It always worked in the Middle Ages. <laughs> no matter what your problem, leeches. <laughs> so I think you probably are all guessing that leeches aren't the solution. Uh, ice bath is probably not the solution. Uh, and you understand this is a very straightforward. Increase the pressure on this side. That makes Q. That's a product. It's product over reactant. It makes Q bigger than K again. And you come back towards reactants. And in general, you don't even have to do the calculation. The general Chatelier's principle is you put stuff on the product side, increase concentrations over here. It goes back to the reactant side. If you put stuff over here, it goes back to the product side. Changing volumes, you have to say, well, where are the more particles? We looked at that. So in this case, yes, give me the oxygen mask. By increasing the partial pressure here, this concentration, the bad one, hemoglobin bound to carbon monoxide goes down and allows you to uh, 
bond bind to oxygen. So uh, yeah, that is a good medical application. So let's think about this one. What happens to the color intensity at equilibrium? So we're back to the same chemical reaction, the dimerization, brown gas dimerizing to clear gas. Now I want to ask the temperature changes. So what happens? So we'll start uh, we'll start a poll. And I'm going to start a poll. So this is captured. So you have this captured in your uh, quiz software because I want to put this up just momentarily. You can you can screen capture this or you have you know you have access to all these JPEG images and the notes. So you can look back. Back in the old days, we did this, and even now we do it in Pimentel. Uh, and uh, we showed this group of four in between the chem quizzes. So everybody had all the information all the time. But you guys have it in front of you. So I will put up uh, possible explanations and let's talk about it. Okay, so uh, let's see what you're thinking on this one. Push your button if you haven't yet. Take a stab. And, uh, oh goodness, we're uh, kind of equally spread out between uh, A and C. Um, so you're thinking 
uh, maybe thinking all kinds of things, but the uh, possible explanations here, raising T shifts uh, towards darker or raising the temperature favors the side with more heat, uh, the products, so it's lighter. Uh, that's just one explanation. You could have all kinds of explanations for these. Uh, so <laughs> uh, I had to write all these possible explanations. <laughs> so I just, you know, uh, uh, usually I know the answers, so I can write one for there. And then I just have to go, what, what crazy reason could it be for the other one? And it's not always crazy reason. We carefully kind of pick these. So we do want you to think, maybe it could be that. Uh, the whole idea is to think through and part of this where you're um, you're critically thinking about what might be a wrong answer, that is a good learning experience too. So talking amongst yourselves, critically evaluating what someone else might say, whether they say it out loud or whether you just read of uh, uh, someone else's opinion. Can you critically think about that? So I'll tell you, I agree with the A's and I agree with the A's. Uh, one way to think about this is I'm adding uh, heat to the entire system, but it's exothermic. We saw that in the first slide. So heat is also a product, essentially. So one way to think of this is the hand wavy, Le Chatelier's principle thing. I'm adding something that's a product that should shift back towards reactants. And that's absolutely fine way to think of this. This will work on the exams. Uh, no, uh, I don't have any problem with that. We could be more uh, quantitative. This is what you'd call a qualitative uh, um, explanation. Doesn't include a number. Uh, we could be quantitative and come up with uh, numbers to look at this. Um, we can uh, look at the reaction. Uh, let's just be slightly more quantitative. So of course, put in some heat shift back towards reactants. The darker gas increases in pressure and it gets darker. Uh, however, we've kind of seen now and we kind of understand this, we've been looking at a bunch of endothermic reactions, a bunch of vaporizations. And for those vaporizations, those poop, my elbow touches the board and we advance. Those endothermic reactions, we found Ks increasing with temperature. You might expect for exothermic Ks decrease with temperature, and we can show this a little later on, so we can do a quantitative understanding of this as well as, well as a qualitative uh, explanation of this. Uh, it looks like we can watch Lonnie, or maybe me, forget who is going to show us this. Looks like me. So I have hot and cold, uh, ice bath and a heat bath, two flasks containing this mixture. So we want to know where does the equilibrium go as I change the temperature. And to make it more dramatic, I cool this side or cool one and heat one so we can see two different, more different temperatures. So we're going to hold them in there for a while. And give time for the temperature. <laughs> Takes time for heat to transfer. We'll bring them back out. And look at that. Darker and lighter. That's just brilliant camera work. We, we did these uh, videos in the studio. Uh, had a great producer director. Um, and uh, we didn't have very much money. So all of these were one take. We just had to get it right the first try and then move on to the next one. <laughs> uh, we did pretty good. There are some mistakes. We went back and we, we, we ac actually um, should go back even more. We found more mistakes as we uh, went. Uh, you know, I'm just talking and I'm uh, thinking ahead. I, I make mistakes here. We already seen that misspeaks. Uh, so we understand this. Let me just do uh, that. So we understand this. Um, it's interesting, this gas is a pollutant gas, and um, we've done a brilliant job in U.S. cities of reducing this gas. Uh, before you guys were all born, uh, I, I talked to um, one of the people in this group is from uh, L.A., 
LA was actually famous for having very bad air, highly polluted air, from the nitrogen emissions in the cars. Back in the day, the 70s, car emissions were not cleaned up. We didn't have catalytic converters. We had uh, uh, the, we burned way too much gas. There were way too many cars. Emissions have dropped dramatically. And that has made the air quality in all of your lifetimes much better in LA. Still gets bad when the, you know it's not a lot of breeze and a lot of traffic. Uh, but in the old days, uh, this is before my time even. I'm, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not that old. Uh, but when I first got to Cal... It was still kind of bad as a graduate student. I did my PhD here. Um, uh, people would visit from LA, you know, fly up and look at our air and uh, be afraid to get off the plane. Uh, I don't see any air. <laughs> I can't see the air. I'm not getting off the plane. They don't have air up here. <laughs> Much more beautifully clean. Maybe if you come from uh, Beijing, actually there's some people sitting in China. Um, they could tell us how it looks today. Oh, no, they can't because it's the middle of the night. Um, but uh, I hear because of the pandemic, the air quality in uh, in Asia is much better, too, in the big cities in uh, China and India. OK. So here's a chemical reaction, extremely important. Nitrogen is not very reactive. We'll look at the molecule more as we go. But there's lots of it in the air. So there's a huge supply of it. And it's important for growth. We use it as a fertilizer. Uh, all our, we need nitrogen is an is important part of our, our DNA and proteins. So we need to have the nitrogen, but we can't breathe it in and use it. And plants can't even, plants are clever. They can breathe in carbon dioxide and use that to make sugar, but they can't do that with nitrogen. Uh, there are a few uh, plants, as you know, legumes that can fix nitrogen from the air into their roots. Uh, very few of those. Um, so we have to fix it. Uh, we have to get it into a reactive form, is what we call by fixation. And this is the famous, uh, do I call it the Haber process? It, it has a name. You don't need to know it. Uh, reacting nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas to form mm -hmm. ammonia gas that gets a reactive gas so we can then do other reactions and use those nitrogen atoms. Uh, that reaction is exothermic. It's slow at 25 degrees C. And the reaction, uh, but the reaction is exothermic. And if you go to high temperature, you get low uh, K. We already saw that. It's exothermic. So heating this up hurts you. It tends to make the equilibrium favor the reactant side. But now we're clever. What will favor the product side? Well, jack up the pressures of these two gases. And you don't have to do it by changing the volume. Just pump a lot of hydrogen and nitrogen gas into the system. If the whole system is at very high pressure, not only the fact that you're adding these gases, but the fact that this has a lower number of particles helps you. So you can make this go. Uh, so the actual conditions, 500 C, so pretty hot, and that's just for kinetics. You want them to be bumping into each other. So you, you want that, that kinetic energy of the particles bumping into each other, the chance to break the, react, the, the uh, bonds, uh, even though that doesn't favor the reaction. It's not very exothermic. Uh, but you go up to 200 atmospheres of uh, those gases. So that makes the reaction go. So we use the Chatelier's principle to make this go. Um, there's actually a, a, a darker side to this story. Uh, you may know uh, nitrogen compounds are also the primary component of explosives. Uh, so dynamite in particular. And dynamite and uh, C4, high nitrogen compounds. So this was actually developed in Germany during World War II to fix nitrogen so they could use it to make uh, dynamite, bigger bombs, bigger explosives. Um, uh, you may know back in the day, they, they're not doing this much anymore. Uh, they still can do it at the airport. They can take a swab of uh, luggage or your hand, and they put that in a machine. And that is very sensitive to nitrogen compounds. It can tell there's 
excess uh, nitrogen, especially oxides, <clears throat> on your hands or on your luggage. So it's a way to detect maybe explosives. Uh, someone had recently handled explosives. They also recently could have handled fertilizer, maybe, although there's less nitrogen oxygen compounds in uh, fertilizer. Uh, so uh, that's done. Actually, that machine, that quadrupolar resonance uh, machine, uh, the person who uh, I share this office with, uh, Professor Pines, um, a great innovator in the kind of technology that can make that kind of instant uh, super sensitive detection, just a couple, you know, uh, uh, super low concentration, you know, dozens and, and uh, not dozens, but uh, parts per million nitrogen compounds on your hand can be detected by that machine. Uh, uh, actually, so I share the office with Professor Pines. Uh, more of my history. I uh, share the office with the Professor Pines. I'm also his academic grandson. So I did my dissertation, my PhD work, with his first graduate student. So I'm one step down the line. And then I graduated, came back to Cal. We worked together uh, when we did some of uh, the early work in quantum computing. Uh, the first quantum computer ever uh, we did downstairs, um, did a computation on a molecule was the computer. Uh, if we have time near the end of the class, I'll explain <clears throat> how quantum computation works. So let's talk about multiple equilibria. So in, if you have any mixture, this is another important concept, any mixture of compounds at all, Every equilibrium reaction that you can write is satisfied at the same time. All the equilibrium must hold at the same time if that mixture is at equilibrium. You can have multiple equilibrium. You can have the compounds A, B, and C in a beaker, and they can interchange. B, let's say, uh, let's say in this case they can. B can uh, convert to C. A can even convert to C. So there's a K that you could write for each of those individual reactions. So the question is, you have the A to B reaction and the B to C reaction. If you were to add those two together, just add uh, chemical reactions, and you'll do this in the course a lot, uh, especially when you're doing thermodynamic cycles, you add two reactions together, you get things to cancel. So the products cancel with the reactants on this side, the Bs cancel, and the result is the A going to C reaction. So when you have that A going to C reaction, you know the two equilibrium constants of A going to B and B going C. So if you did not know the reaction constant, the equilibrium constant of A going to C, could you get it from A and B equilibrium constants? And I think you know you probably can. If you can add the two reactions, then what does that mean? Well, K3, A going to C, is the C concentration of C over the concentration of A. That's how we'd write the expression. At equilibrium, those don't change, so it's a constant. That looks like B over A, B concentration over A concentration, which is a constant at equilibrium, and it's equal to K1. And if I were to multiply by C over B, which happens to be the equilibrium expression for reaction two, the product of those two, but the ratio of those is constant at equilibrium. The ratio of those is constant at equilibrium. So this reaction, K1 times K2, must equal K3. So if the general rule, if you add chemical reactions, multiply their equilibrium expressions. That should kind of ring clear to you because you know there's exponentials. <clears throat> if you were to take the logarithms, you would say adding is just like um, multiplying the um, exponents.
Maybe you don't think that way. <laughs> no one understands logarithms. <laughs> you, we wouldn't have to anymore. We have calculators. The, the, the bad thing, the silly thing in chemistry is we still use this pH scale. So we have to harp on you later about logarithms. There's a logarithmic scale. Um, and it's useful to think about things that way. However, add reactions, multiply equilibrium constants. That's what you need to know. The take-home lesson, uh, it's an easy take-home lesson. And of course, the enthalpies add. So if you add two reactions, you would add the enthalpies to get the, react the, the enthalpy of the third reaction. OK, let's just talk through this. Here's a molecular rearrangement. Oh, no graphic there? So there's a <clears throat> molecular rearrangement. A, rearranging the bonds here. So it's a uh, forming and breaking of bonds. That has an enthalpy. That has an enthalpy. The question is, how does K depend on T? for the reaction A going to C. Uh, I should put that on the slide. Um, now, we talk about what's going to be on the exam. Uh, we'll talk about it a little more. Uh, you should focus on chem quizzes quite uh, a lot. You should focus on the chem quizzes as much as you focus on the homework when you're studying for the exam. Uh, I'll tell you right now, it's not a secret. The exam is going to be conceptual. I said that at the beginning of class. Chem quizzes are the conceptual things. This one's quite conceptual. You have to bring together all kinds of stuff to understand this. I'm asking for K versus T. Now, you should be in the back of your head. We've been looking at equilibrium constants versus temperature, and we've kind of established if they're endothermic K increases with T if they're exothermic K decreases with T. So if we could figure out A to C the enthalpy, whether it's exothermic or endothermic, we could predict how it varies with K. And of course you can do that because we've already uh, gone through this. Enthalpy of A going to B and then B going to C. I'm going to say A is equal and opposite magnitude of B going to C. And why am I saying that? Well, all I do is break all these bonds and then reform them. So I put energy in, that's endothermic. If you take nothing else home from Chem 1, breaking bonds always requires energy. But then when you make them, energy is always released. And in this case, you break and make the same number and same kinds of bonds. We'll talk about this quite a bit more later. There won't be any specific questions about bond breaking and bond making on the exam. Just this kind of qualitative stuff. If you break it, it takes energy. If you make it, you release energy. So they happen to be equal and opposite. So the enthalpy of the re last reaction is zero. K doesn't depend on temperature. Woohoo. OK, so. We are at the stage where let's uh, step back and see where we've come on our quest to explain and understand everything on this slide. Everything on this diagram. So we're getting an understanding now. I can talk about plotting energy on this side. And, and you can plot enthalpy, if you'd like, on this axis. You can plot delta E, the energy. We use enthalpy almost exclusively uh, in chemistry. You could plot free energy difference on this axis. And that's a handy one to plot because then the positions of the reactants and the products tell you the free energy difference. So that gives you an extra piece of information. If this were the enthalpy, if this is just enthalpy, then the relative enthalpies, this is an exothermic chemical reaction, the relative enthalpies you could get from products minus reactants, but it wouldn't tell you if the reaction was spontaneous. It wouldn't tell you if it favors products 
at equilibrium. Let me say that one more time. I'm not sure I've said it enough. All spontaneous means, and we've got an understanding now, all spontaneous means, get that word of the, 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 the idea that spontaneity has something to do with surprise parties and all that out of your head. All it means thermodynamically is products are favored at equilibrium. That's all it means. If it's not spontaneous, reactants are favored at equilibrium. So plotting delta G here is helpful because that tells you in this reaction, products are favored at equilibrium. We know exothermic reactions can be spontaneous, but endothermic reactions can also favor products at equilibrium. So just plotting the enthalpy, you don't get that piece of information. So we're seeing, we're understanding what's going on here. We've talked now about the relative concentrations of the products and reactants at equilibrium. So in this case, we could do it all in the gas phase, say those are all gas phase, the relative pressures of hydrogen, oxygen, and water gas at equilibrium. In this case, that is exothermic, and it is, uh, the free energy does decrease. The products are extremely favored at equilibrium. Essentially, it goes to completion. It makes all water and explodes. That information is included here. This information is included that it doesn't explode if it's just sitting there because there's an energy barrier, even in free energy, between the reactants and the products. We have to give the reactants this high energy. We have to light a, fl light, light a flame under them, give them the kinetic energy to bounce together and uh, break and make bonds, form water. We saw you could do it with a catalyst if you put platinum in here. Uh, let hydrogen uh, uh, adhere to the surface of uh, platinum. It will react very easily with the uh, oxygen in the atmosphere and react essentially at room temperature, no flame needed. Catalyst is so important. You can see already that catalysis, uh, our bodies work exclusively on catalysis. All our enzymes in our body make reactions go that normally would not go at our body temperature and conditions. But that catalysis, platinum, so valuable. I can get the thermodynamic release. I can get the free energy out of these two molecules, convert them to those two molecules simply by having platinum present. Don't have to heat it up. I get that energy out in a very easy way. Catalysis is incredibly important. So we understand these spacings. We understand something about the molecules on each side, their ratios, the high roads and the low roads. We understand about relative masses and how to calculate from relative masses how much water would be produced, what reagent limits the chemical reaction, because relative masses are proportional to the number of particles, and it's the number of particles that we need to keep track of. You know, I always say, I have told you before, I don't care what the number of particles is. I don't care if it's Avogadro's 10 to the 23rd number. It's not, who cares what the number is? It's just this ginormous crazy number. What we wanna make sure is, the numbers of molecules are commensurate uh, of the reaction uh, happening. This particles are appropriate. Twice as many hydrogen particles as oxygen particles will give us this perfect stoichiometry, and the reaction can proceed. So let's just add everything up. We just kind of did a summary there. Let's. Uh, formalize that summary. So free energy and equilibrium. We've been saying all along, it sounds like free energy and equilibrium constants are related because large Ks, K greater than one, means products are favored at equilibrium. Negative free energy changes means the products are favored at equilibrium. So we can kind of codify that. If K is bigger than one, products are favored at equilibrium. Same if the standard state free energy is less 
than zero. Did I say one? Yeah, one. Uh, one is the is the tipping point for equilibria. Zero, the tipping point for free energy. So free energy is negative, less than zero. You get a spontaneous reaction. All that means products are favored at equilibrium. K greater than one, products favored at equilibrium. Other direction, free energy changes greater than zero. Reactants are favored at equilibrium. K is less than one. Reactants are favored at equilibrium. And of course, if the standard state free energy difference between the two is zero, then K also equals one. That one I hope you can get on your own because I'm going to harp on you. Standard state is what? All the products and reactants, one atmosphere or one molar. Everything is one. So what is K? All it can be is one. <laughs> so if the standard state free energy difference is zero, and that would be rare, that would say it's at equilibrium where everything is at one molar and one atmosphere. Uh, I say it over and over again, this is an artificial state. You would never expect to see that. If you did, it would just tell you that's an equilibrium. Everything in one atmosphere is the equilibrium, and the equilibrium constant would be one. Neither products nor reactants are favored. So we can uh, codify that. We're not going to do the math, but the relationship between K and uh, the standard state free energy, it's not linear. So these natural logs come in, and now you see, oh, these natural logs come in. When you add enthalpies, you would multiply. You would get these powers and multiply Ks. So uh, the actual formula is standard state free energy difference, the standard state free energy difference, not you, – you can take – uh, you can measure free energy differences anytime, just like you can measure Qs anytime. But so you could take all reactants and no products, not one atmosphere of everything, and measure a free energy difference. That's okay. You can do that. We we just come. We just use standard states because there's too many different reactions we could go in too many different concentrations. So if we just want to compare in broad terms all compounds, then let's put everybody at the same playing field. But you can measure free energies, enthalpies. Obviously, you start with uh, more products uh, or more reactants. You can get more heat evolved. Enthalpies depend on their extensive properties. You can measure reaction free energies. This, the standard state, the difference in free energy between all the products at one atmosphere and all the reactants at one atmosphere or one molar concentration. That is equal to minus RT ln K. Natural log of K. You have a calculator, you can figure that out. T is the absolute temperature in Kelvin, remember, and R is a constant. Uh, that constant you could write in a lot of different units. It's called the gas constant. Uh, you can look that number up, just a constant as far as we're concerned. Uh, if you're good at math, you can rearrange that and say K is exponential. This means E to the power minus delta G over RT. So you can do inverse relationships. The exponential function is the inverse relationship of the natural log function. So we'll stop there um, and we'll look at this one tomorrow. Uh, do a screen capture now. <laughs> uh, I challenge you. <laughs> that little standard state, that little degree sign. <laughs> we, the first thing we did today was this. Can you do it again uh, now? Okay, screen capture. And we'll see you all again tomorrow.